Praise the Lord. You are cold. I said, Praise the Lord. The Lord bring hallelujah into every life in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah in your ministry. Amen. Hallelujah in your work. Amen. The praise of God in your life in Jesus' name. Amen. It will happen. Amen. This year it must happen. Amen. The glory of the Lord will be in every life. Amen. Father, we thank you for our leadership development tonight. Thank you for your people. Thank you for bringing us here. Thank you, Lord, for the strength and the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon everyone. We're asking, O Lord, that this work will prosper in every hand more than ever before in Jesus' name. And all we have been learning will bear fruit in our ministry, in our families, in our lives this year in Jesus' name. We're praying that you'll confirm your blessing upon every life. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. Better amen before you sit down. Amen. God bless you. We started actually a new series on leadership last Tuesday. You might not have realized that. We're taking the letters of the word leadership. And last week, I dealt with L, leading the flock of Christ with Christ-like love. Leading the flock of Christ, the church of Christ, the people of Christ, the assembly that is called out, leading that assembly, leading that flock with Christ-like love. And we said at that time that our leadership, to produce people like the Lord, that we should reproduce the leadership of Christ in our own leadership. And I said, it's very necessary. If we're following the Lord in leadership, we must be saved. We must be sanctified. And we need to be spirit-filled, baptized in the Holy Ghost. And that true leadership, Effective leadership, productive leadership will mean that we love, we are loving. It will mean that we are equipping the workers and the members of the church. We are advancing, advancing them. We are leading them to move forward. We are discipling them. We are actually teaching them, schooling them so that they will grow, grow in knowledge grow in understanding, and grow in their zeal and work for the Lord. It means we're exemplifying. We need to exemplify leadership to the people we're leading, we're reproducing, we're sacrificing, we're harvesting, and we're instructing as well as persevering. And I did tell you at that time that everyone finishes, every one of those words ends with I-N-G. Which means a continuous sin, a continuous sin. We keep on, keep on, keep on doing what we're doing and we're perfecting everything as well. And I did mention at that time that if we're going to lead, our lives must reflect the life of a leader. What kind of life? An undefiled life, an uncompromising life, an unspotted life, an unreprovable life on faith life, on believable life, as well as on movable life. You'll be unmovable in Jesus' name. Then I spoke on the other side of leadership, the negative side, that in leadership, the leadership of Christ, Christ-like leadership, does not have any room for lawlessness, no room for enmity, no room for anger, there's no room for darkness. There's no room for somebody going into the paths of darkness and using the power of darkness in the church of the living God. You cannot use Satan's power to build the kingdom of Christ. There will be no extortion. Christ-like leadership does not accept and there's no room for extortion or rebellion or strife or hypocrisy or idolatry, 
or pride, pride in any form. And then I made use of some personalities, and I told you from the Bible that Christ's leadership will not admit these personalities, Lucifer, Esau, Absalom, Diotrephes, Eli, Reuben, Saul, Haman, Iscariot, Judas, and Pilate. Why not? Because of licentiousness in Lucifer. And so anyone who has a licentious life does not qualify to be a leader in the kingdom of God, in the world, in the work of God. Esau, why? Excluded Esau. His stomach was more important to him than the birthright. Belly instead of birthright. And because of that indulgence, he was excluded. And such a personality as Esau is unqualified in leadership. Absalom, why? Abominable Absalom. And because of that abomination in his life, he was not qualified, he was disqualified. Diotrephes, domineering Diotrephes. The one that likes to pounce on people, control people, crush people, destroy people, cast out people, so that he can remain in leadership. There's no room for that in the kingdom of God. Domineering Diotrephes, effeminate Eli. Effeminate, doesn't have any backbone. Like an amphibian, is here, is there. And he knew that the children were not living right. He could do nothing. His eyes were dim spiritually, weak, spineless, effeminate. Robin, rootless. Robin, no root. And because he has no root, the wind will blow and blow him up. Saul, self satisfied Saul. Self sufficient soul, self indulgent soul. And such people, you check up your character. And when the new year, we want to build the leadership that is centered on the word of God. Haman, hardened Haman, didn't have, will not have any chance in leading the flock of God. Iscariot, incorrigible Iscariot. Pilate, place seeking Pilate. And so as we look at all these leadership traits, we want to develop our own leadership, our own lives, our ministry, so that we lead the flock of God with Christ-like love. That's L. We dealt with that last week. This week, we're dealing with the next letter, E. And the topic tonight is excellent leadership, in an expanding ministry. Excellent leadership in an expanding ministry. As we're serving the Lord, our work must grow. Our ministry must grow. And we must have expansion. We must have extension in every area of consideration in ministry. Excellent leadership in an expanding ministry. We're looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 14. In chapter 14, we're looking at verse 12. It says in verse 12, Even so, ye, for as much as ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that she may excel to the edifying of the church. Seek, prepare yourself, and produce excellence in ministry. Seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. The reason why ministry is so that the church will be edified, the church will be built up, and the church will grow, and the church will expand, and we need to have excellence in ministry. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 22. Proverbs chapter 22. We're reading from verse 20. Proverbs 22. Reading from verse 20. 
here is what the Lord is telling us in Proverbs 22, verse 20. 22, 20. Have not I reaching thee excellent things in counsel and knowledge? It's telling us as we read the word of God, as we study the word of God, so that we can upgrade our leadership, so that we can improve on our leadership. It says we should go back to the word of God because he has reaching unto us excellent things in counsel. Excellent things in knowledge, verse 21, that I might make thee to know the certainty of the words of truth. That's why we learn. That's why we come here every time, so that we will know the certainty of the truth. And he goes on to say that thou mightest answer the words of truth to them that send unto thee. The teaching we're having the instruction we're having, the discipline we're having, the development we're having will make us to preach well and teach well and counsel well and lead other people in the right direction so that the best will come out of their lives. The best will come out of your converts in Jesus' name. First Corinthians, we're looking at chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, reading from verse 31. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're reading from verse 31. It says in verse 31, the last verse there, but covet earnestly, the best gives, desire earnestly, the best gives, and passionately seek after, the best gives, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. Show I unto you a more excellent way. The topic tonight, excellent leadership in an expanding ministry. Three things we're looking at. Number one, expensive exaltation of the lost to leadership. Expensive, very costly. When we lift up, when we exalt, those who are lost, to come and lead the lost, expensive exaltation of the lost to leadership. Point number two, extensive evangelism as landmark from the Lord. The Lord himself has given us a landmark in ministry by his life, by his labor, by his ministry, by his ministration, by his model, everything he did, he has given us a landmark. And he has given us something that must not be missing from our labor for the Lord. Extensive evangelism as landmark from the Lord. Point number three, exceeding expectations in the labor of love. That is, you have an expectation. We have an expectation. The church has an expectation of you as a leader, as a minister. And yet, as you minister, you exceed the expectations. You go beyond the expectations. And we, we have, you know, things that are stated as to this is what a fellowship leader ought to do, a zonal leader ought to do, a woman rep ought to do, and what a coordinator, church pastor ought to do, group pastor ought to do, and uh, state pastor, region pastor, national overseer, what you ought to do, and we exceed that. And we go beyond that, exceeding expectations in the labor of love. We come to point number one. Point number one, expensive exaltation of the lost to leadership. We're looking at the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15. We're reading from verses 13. And 14. Matthew chapter 15, reading from verse 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my father has not planted shall be rooted up. It's telling us something here. If a sinner is in leadership, the Lord has not planted that sinner in leadership of the church. 
If a backslider is in the leadership of the church, the Lord has not planted a backslider to lead the church. And if a religious hypocrite is a leader in the church, the Lord has not planted that religious hypocrite to lead the church. What happens then? Every plant, no exception, every plant at every level, every plant in every section, every plant in every one that is called, every congregation called the church of the Lord, every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Rooted up, may do it now. Rooted up, may do it later. Rooted up, up Obviously and definitely in eternity will have no root and will not have a place in the kingdom. Look at verse 14. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. Those are the words of Jesus. Let them alone. They are unteachable. Let them alone. They are unteachable, untouchable. Let, leave them alone. Let them alone. They are unusable. Let them alone. They shield themselves from my words that will bring conversion to them. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. If the blind leave the blind, it's talking about a blind preacher. It's talking about a blind witness. It's talking about a blind religious uh, authority. And if the blind claim in authority, and if the blind claim in that he knows the way, if the blind leads the blind, both the one leading and the one that is led will fall into the ditch. What does that mean? Will perish eventually. Because heaven is not a ditch, but hell is the ditch. What did he mean by the blind cannot lead the blind? We're coming to Second Corinthians chapter 4. In Second Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verses 3 and 4. Second Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 3 and verse 4. But if a gospel be heed, it is heed to them that are lost. If the gospel be hidden from preachers, if the gospel be hidden from witnesses, if the gospel be hidden to religious people who are running up and down to make more proselytes, it says, if a gospel be hid, it is he to them that are lost. Look at verse 4. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of the people of them that believe not, is uh, making the lost to be the blinded ones. So the blind is the lost. And when he said, if the blind leads the blind, both those blind people, the leader and the follower, will fall into the ditch. Substitute the word, the lost, because they mean the same thing. If the lost leads the lost, both of them will fall into the ditch. Why? Because they are blind. In Ephesians, I'm reading from chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 18. Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 18. Having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Bring those two words together. Ignorant, blind. Blind, ignorant. That's what we have in that verse. How do we tally that, relate that with the words of Jesus? If the blind lead the blind, both of them shall fall into the ditch. If the ignorant lead the ignorant, both of them will fall into the ditch. Somebody is uh, ignorant of salvation. 
ignorance of holiness without which no man shall save the Lord. Ignorance of the qualification to get to the kingdom of God and to have eternal life. If the ignorant leads the ignorant, both shall fall into the ditch. We're coming to um, Second Peter chapter 1. In Second Peter chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 9. 2 Peter 1 verse 9. Here is what it says. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see and far off. And has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. He has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. What do you learn from that? The forgetful are blind. They are forgetful of the purpose of salvation. They are forgetful of the experience they had when they first came to the Lord. They are forgetful of the victory that they had and now they are backsliding. And they don't even understand what is saved life ought to mean. The forgetful are blind. That's what that verse says. What do we tell? How do we line that up with the words of Jesus? If the forgetful leads the forgetful, both of them shall fall into the ditch. As you look at the average church member, as you look at the average church goer, they're forgetful. They hear something now, in a few hours, they're forgotten. And if their pastor, if their leader, if their teacher is the same as them, and he has forgotten the old standard. He has forgotten the old landmark. He has forgotten the word of God that he should earnestly contend for. If the forgetful leads the forgetful, both of them will fall into the ditch. I'm looking at Revelation. In Revelation chapter 3, as we look at Revelation chapter 3, we're reading from verse 16 and verse 17. Revelation chapter 3 verse 16 and verse 17 so then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot i will spill thee out of my mouth because thou sayest i am rich and increase with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art miserable wretched Miserable and poor and blind and naked. How do you, what do you make of those two verses? The lukewarm is blind. The one, he can be kind of excited if he's watching football. He can be excited when they're talking about politics. And when there is rioting or whatever, he can be very zealous and excited and enthusiastic. When you come to the things of God... It's lukewarm, it's weak-minded, it's sluggish, it's low, and it wants to be a leader. And if the lukewarm leads the lukewarm, both of them will fall into the ditch. I pray God will bring fire inside everyone. Fervency every, in everyone. That all the lukewarmness that makes people blind spiritually will not be in your life, in my life, in our lives, in Jesus' name. A new year. Amen. Are you keen at Isaiah chapter 59? If the blind lead the blind, both of them shall fall into the ditch. Are you keen at um, Isaiah chapter 59? And I'm reading from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 10. We grow for the wall like the blind. We grow perceive we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as, at, as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. That verse 10 says we're groping. We don't know the truth. We're searching. We don't know the truth. That's what he was saying. And we're feeling our way through. Where's the truth? Where's wisdom? Where's life? Where's salvation? And where's healing? Where is power? And we're all groping. It says we grope like the blind. We're all all like bears and mourners saw, like 
doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. We look for salvation, but it is far from us, the people who are preaching, who do not have assurance of salvation. And every time they cry a little, and then they stop the prayer, they try to repent, they do not repent to the logical conclusion. And the repentance is not deep, it's not genuine. And they're looking for salvation, looking for salvation, and it is far from them. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us. As for our iniquities, we know them in transgressing and departing against, uh, in um, transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. If anybody like that is in leadership, his life is all confused. His life is not straightened out. His life, his heart is not cleansed. And it says, while those transgressions are there, you are blind. And it is an expensive exaltation to, to lift up the lost into leadership. Why? Because if the falling, those are falling into sin, if the falling leads the falling, both of them will fall into the ditch. We're looking at Lamentation chapter 4. Lamentation chapter 4. We're reading from verse 14. Lamentation chapter 4. Reading from verse 14. The blind must not lead the blind. And if you are blind, you ought to check up with all these verses we're reading. And then do something about it so that you will not be the blind, leading the blind, causing many people to fall into the ditch. Lamentation chapter 4, we're reading from verse 14. In verse 14 of Lamentation chapter 4, here is what it reads. They have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have wandered as blind men in the streets. They have polluted themselves with blood so that the men so that men could not touch their garments. You come near and they are polluted. And you can feel, you can sense the odor of the pollution. Maybe it's a drunkard, it's in leadership. Maybe it's a smoker, it's in leadership. Maybe it's the one that is, you know, going about uh, have embracing this and embracing that, and you can perceive the odor of the people he has been kissing, and he says he's a leader, but he's a wanderer, wanderer. The wanderers are blind. Those who are wandering from church to church, they are wandering from assembly to assembly, they are wandering from message to messenger. They hear the message here, that, and they will not pray about it. Then they go on the internet, they are looking for something else, and they are listening to this message, this message, and the one they are hearing over the internet and seeing on the YouTube, what, what has now, everything they have heard here. They do not have conviction because they wonder about if the wanderer leads the wanderer, both of them will fall into the ditch. You check up your life. Are you a wanderer? Or do you stay? Do you abide with the word of God? Jesus has told us the word that cannot change and the word that remains firm unto the end, that if the blind leads the blind, both of them will fall into the ditch and the wanderers are blind. I pray that the Lord will open our eyes. We will not remain blind. Amen. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 56. Isaiah chapter 56. I'm reading from verse 10. Isaiah chapter 56, verse 10. Is watch men are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. They are all greedy dogs 
which cannot have enough. They are greedy dogs which cannot have enough. What's he telling us? The greedy is blind. A greedy watchman. A greedy preacher. A greedy pastor. He wants this and wants this and wants that. And when we talk of greed, it's not only about money. When we talk of greed, a person might be greedy for position. He is handling this. He's holding this. He wants to hold another one. He wants to hold another one. We say, sir, there are other people too. Let everyone do a bit. You do your part. I do my part. Let us do our part and let him do his part. But no, he's greedy. He wants everything. He wants to control this, control this, control this, control that. He's greedy for position. He's greedy for power. Power drunk and money that he wants. Every, everything. What do I get out of this? The greedy is blind. And the Lord Jesus said that the greedy the blind, if he leads the greedy blind people like himself, both of them will fall into the ditch. I'm looking at Matthew chapter 23. Matthew chapter 23. And we're reading from verse 23 to verse 28. Matthew chapter 23. We're reading from verse 23. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithes of meat and anise and cumin, and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone. Ye blind guides, blind guides, they were hypocritical, but they were so eager to lead other people. And Christ, the leader, and Christ, the Savior, came. They won't allow Jesus. He preached the word that will take people to everlasting life. They won't allow him. They're taking the people who are leading away. And anyone that followed Jesus Christ, they'll cast him out of their synagogue. But they were blind guides which strain at a knot and swallow a camel. One to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye make clean the outside of the car and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess, the blind Pharisee. Cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and uh, iniquity. Look at verse 15. In verse 15, one to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye compass land and uh, sea and land to make one proselyte, one convert, one disciple. And when he is made, he make him to fold more the child of hell than yourselves. Verse 16, one to you, ye blind guides. Look at verse 33. It happens, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? Remember now. If the blind leads the blind, both of them will fall into the ditch. If the hypocrite leads the hypocrite, both of them will fall into the ditch. I pray you'll not be a hypocrite. You'll not be blind. You'll not be the lost. You'll not be the ignorant. You will not be the forgetful. You will not be the lukewarm. You'll not be the falling backslider. You'll not be a wanderer, wandering here and there in Jesus' name. You'll not be greedy of anything. You'll not be a hypocrite.
the Lord may cause real leaders who are saved, who are cleansed, who are purged, who are purified, who are empowered and deal with the power of the Holy Ghost and will lead the right and our eyes are open, our minds are open, our hearts are open. We will not be blind leaders of the blind in Jesus' name. Point number two now, extensive evangelism as the landmark from the Lord. The Lord himself has laid an example. He has given us what to do. And he did it first himself. And that has become a landmark. Anything Christ has done, and then he emphasized, and then he commanded, and he said, this is what to do. I've done it. I've laid the example. I've given you an example as to what you ought to do. He set that down as a landmark. We're looking at Proverbs. So important. The landmark is Proverbs chapter 22. Reading from verse 28. Proverbs chapter, tw chapter 22, verse 28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Christ has set the landmark. And the apostles took up that landmark because they said, This is what he commanded. He set it, the landmark. And we are doing it, the landmark. And they have passed it on to us who are following after. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have said, our fathers in the faith, our fathers in the ministry. They have set that landmark as Christ has given. We're not going to remove the landmark in Jesus' name. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 23, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 23. Reading from verse 10, remove not the old landmark. Remove not the old landmark. Don't substitute the old landmark with a new generation psychedelic way of worship. This is the way they're doing it now. And this is the way the old assemblies are doing it. There are many people that are forsaking the old landmark. And they are now carrying about something modern, something new, something worthless, something rootless, something with no value, something valueless. It says, remove not the old landmark and enter not into the fields of the fatherless. Enter not into the fields of the fatherless. What has Christ done that then becomes for us, for you? For me, for everyone, a landmark that we must not remove from our lives, remove from our families, or remove from our ministry, or remove from the calling the Lord has given us. Let's see what, what Christ did, Matthew chapter 9. In Matthew chapter 9, we're reading from verse 35. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness, and every disease among the people. That's the landmark Jesus Christ has said. He didn't just stay in one place in an upper room. He didn't stay in one place in a well-built sanctuary. Anyone that needs salvation, let them come over here. Anyone that needs enlightenment knowledge of the word of God, let them come over here. I'm here. The teacher that has come from heaven, and if you know you need that teaching that will save your life, here I am. Here is where I stay. They never go out. It says here, but, but that he went to all the cities and all the villages. Well, then you are a group pastor. Are you going to all those communities? 
Are you touching everywhere? Are you organizing the members of the church, of the group? Not just uh, maybe once in a month or once in three months, once in a quarter. But like Jesus Christ, you're reaching every city, every village, every community. And when you go there, you're not talking politics. When you go there, you're not talking uh, security, security. When you get over there, you're not talking about wealth. You're not talking about how to succeed, how to achieve, how to have this and that. The landmark that Jesus Christ has said is that he went about all the cities and all the villages teaching the word of God in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing there are people who are uh, taking healing away. Oh, they say, no, you know, the, in the modern world, we now have the hospitals, and we now have the clinics, and we now have the nurses, we now have the doctors, and they have transferred the ministry of Christ into the hands of those uh, uh, doctors. And you, you will know that not all the doctors are born again, not all the doctors are children of God. In fact, the majority are not born again. I will transfer the ministry of Christ into their hands. And there are people who say they are ministers now. They cannot pray for the sick. They cannot uh, deliver the oppressed. They cannot pray to have uh, the gifts and the calling uh, that, God, that Christ had. But you know what Jesus did? He healed every sickness and he healed every disease among the people. And in verse 36, but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. They had Pharisees, but they had no shepherd. They had scribes, but they had no shepherd. They had religious leaders, unsaved, unrighteous, rigid religious leaders, but they had no shepherd. They had synagogues, they had sanctuaries, but they had no shepherd. There are many people who might belong to that denomination, that domination. They're not caring about salvation. And when you talk to them, oh, they say, I have my own church too, but you have no shepherd. You have no salvation. And the declaration of the gospel has not been made known unto them. Then it says, then says he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Then he says, pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. There are so-called leaders. They don't know how to bring more workers, how to bring more people, harvesters. And they say, we have enough. Look at the church. And we have 100 members. And we have 10 workers. Isn't that enough for the 100 members? Are you only catering for those 100 members? Or are you thinking of the whole community? He wants the gospel preached to everyone. And he says, pray ye therefore. Plan ye therefore. Persevere, therefore, and labor, therefore, to bring more laborers into the harvest field. I pray God will open our eyes. We'll do what needs to be done. And more laborers will come into the vineyard in Jesus' name. We're looking at Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 35. Mark chapter 1, verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. Prayer is wonderful. And Christ prayed. But you see, there are people that major only on prayer. No preaching, no evangelization, no touching the lives of people. I'm praying. And they are prayer warriors. They stay in their homes. They pray and pray and pray. They will not preach. If you call them for evangelism, I'm praying. If you call them to do any work for the kingdom of God, to expand and extend the kingdom of God, I am praying. Jesus prayed also. But he didn't limit his ministry to praying. Verse 36, And Simon 
and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. There are people, if they have some success, a little success, in their little district, in their little community, and all men are seeking for them. And early in the morning, people are knocking at their doors. Pastor, I'm sick. Pray for me. And Pastor, my child is having a challenge. Pray for him. And people are coming and coming. Their minds will not go beyond that little house where they are that little community where they are. And they will say, all men are looking for me. And if they're not careful, even in times of meeting, Monday Bible study, they say, I, as I wanted to go out, this person came and said, see my challenge, and they know me here as the one that will take their problems to the Lord. They'll drop their Bible. They'll not come to the Bible study. They're praying and praying and praying. All men are seeking for thee. We need to have the mind of Christ. We need to have the heart of Christ. And we need to have the calling of Christ so that we have extensive evangelism as landmark from the Lord. And let's look at verse 38. And he said unto them, unto them that called him, unto them that said all men are seeking for you, Unto them that wanted to tie him down and pin him down to just that locality. And he said unto them, let us go into the next towns. Let us go into the next towns. The governors of the states do not put street light only on one street and allow all the other streets to remain dark and say that they are governing very well. The government of the land do not put facility into one community, and then all the other communities are void of those uh, facilities. They put those facilities everywhere. The gospel is not only for one house. The gospel is not only one for one community. The gospel is for all the towns, all the cities, and all the villages. Let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. Therefore came I forth. Do you know why you came? And do you know why you are in the ministry? Do you know what you are supposed to do? You are supposed to expand. You're supposed to extend. You're supposed to go beyond that little community. We're looking at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. He had appointed uh, the 12 in the previous chapter. Now he appointed Seventy others also, and he sent them two and two. Seventy divided by two, that means thirty-five. He sent them to thirty-five cities that they will go there, two and two, before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Whither he himself would come whither he himself would come. What does that mean? Even though he had sent them out and they were to preach the gospel there, he said, go there, go there, go there, go there. Then he didn't say, I've got so many disciples. I've got so many investors. I've got so many soul winners. So I can rest. So I can sit back. Whither he himself will come. All those places and all those cities that those people went, he also went there. We're looking at Luke chapter 13. That Christ expand the territory, extend the work that ought to be done. We're looking at Luke chapter 13, verse 22. And he went through the villages, the cities, and the villages. And he went through. He didn't stay in one city and then just pull the sand. Wonderful. The sick are being healed here. I hope other cities were here about the information 
and the testimonies, and they will come. He went to them. And we're told they went through the cities and villages, teaching and journeying, teaching and journeying, teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there a few that be saved? Obviously, they have been teaching about salvation. That's why they ask, are there a few that be saved? He had been given the condition of salvation. That's why somebody asked, what if everybody cannot meet that condition? What if everybody will not repent? What if everybody will not make their restitution? What if everybody will not believe that you are the Christ? What if everybody will not have conversion? Are there few that be saved? And he said unto them, strive to enter in at the straight gate as he went from city to city. And village to village, it wasn't lowering the standards. It wasn't uh, giving them a watered-down gospel. He told them, enter to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. He went everywhere preaching the word. That's a landmark. That's what he has led for us. We will follow. We will do what he has done. We're not going to remove that landmark of soul winning, harvesting of souls, and evangelism. And we're not going to remove the landmark of teaching the real truth until the people know here is the way to be saved and they have real salvation. Luke chapter 19. In Luke chapter 19, I'm reading from verse 1. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a certain man, Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not, could not for the press, for the crowd, for the multitude, because he was of little stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up. When Jesus came to the place, remember, he was going to Jerusalem. And his might, his face was set like a flinch, going to Jerusalem. But you see, there are people, where they're going is where they're going. They aren't going to see anything in the way, anything in their journey. All they want, I'm going there, I'm getting there. But Jesus Christ knew that his soul was there in need of salvation. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must abide in thine house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with a man that is a sinner. Some people cannot bear criticism. A little criticism, then they give up. They can't do that again. As they criticized Christ, and he said he's going to be guest with a man that is, to, that is a sinner. Understand? All these people that were criticizing, they were sinners. They saw Jesus. They didn't have his salvation. And now Christ is going to save his sinner. And these sinners are complaining that he's going to the sinner. Many of the people that criticize, they have no place going. They have nothing doing. They have no salvation to offer. And they themselves do not possess the salvation. And if you allow a sinner to hinder you, a backslider to hinder you, then the sinner is more powerful than you are. And his project of hindering the salvation of people is greater than your own power of wanting people to be saved. Jesus went on. We're going on. I am going on. 
you will go on in Jesus' name. As the kill stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. That's real salvation. The salvation that changes life. The salvation that makes a person to return stolen property to their rightful owner. And Jesus said unto him, he didn't talk to them, he didn't talk to those people opposing and finding fault, but he said unto him, this day is salvation come to this house for so much, for as much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That's the landmark he has left for us. That's the work he has left for us. And he has shown us an example how we did it. And we ought to do it the same way. What we'll do in Jesus' name. Luke chapter 22. I'm reading from verse 47. Luke chapter 22. We're reading from verse 47. And what did yet speak? Behold, the multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Verse 50. And one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear and Jesus answered and said suffer ye thus far and he touched his ear and healed him it was near crucifixion he continued the work he was betrayed he continued the work they were going to arrest him just now and he continued the work and when Peter slashed off the ear of that, of one of the multitude, wanting to arrest Jesus, the Lord Jesus took down and took that ear that was cut off, put it back again, and healed him. His ministry continued unto the end. Whether you are problem or not, persecuted or not, driven here or not, and arrested or not, the work must continue. That is the landmark he has left for us. Chapter 23. I'm reading from verse 34. Chapter 23 of Luke. Reading from verse 34. Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his garment and cast lots. It was now on the cross. It was having pain. They nailed him to the cross. They're taking his garment from him. And they were parting the garment. And yet, he was still concerned for the sinners. He was still concerned that they will be saved. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Look at verse 42. In verse 42, and he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest unto into thy kingdom. It was now the cross. There was one of the thieves on the cross too, wanting salvation. And he's saying, Lord, remember me. And he was having so much pain. He said, I thirst. And he gave him gall to drink. In the midst of that pain, he was still getting somebody to get to heaven. To save the lost. Which is telling us the landmark Christ has left. Once you have the voice to speak, the eyes to reach, and the hands to handle, whatever else you are going through, the landmark he has left us is that you will still be evangelizing and taking sinners out of the brink of hell, taking them to heaven. Look at verse 43 there. 
And Jesus said unto him, Verily, I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. I pray you'll be like Christ. I will be like Christ. I will be like Christ. I'm not hearing you well. You'll be like Christ in Jesus' name. Chapter 24 of Luke. Luke chapter 24. And we're reading from verse 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you, while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding, that they might understand the scriptures. And he said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer, and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. He rose from the dead. He appeared to his own disciples, and he appeared in the glorified form. And instead of seeing, you see the Pharisees, what they have done, but now I rose from the dead. Instead of bragging on what had happened, he still came back to that evangelism. What do you have? I've got a miracle. I've got resurrection. I've got a risen life. I've got prosperity. I've got success. I've got this and that. And the celebration of the success will not allow you to do the work of God. But Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he appeared to his own disciples and he brought them back to that landmark. And he said that repentance and remission of sins must be preached in his name among all nations beginning at Jerusalem. I pray we'll all have the mind of Christ. You'll have more of the mind of Christ. We'll have more of the mind of Christ in Jesus' name. Point number three now, exceeding expectations in the labor of love. That's what the Lord is expecting of us, is not to say, I've done what he said. He told us to go out. I went out. He said it's from two to four. And I went out at two. And when I saw that it was four o'clock, I came back home. You could have continued. You could have exceeded expectations. They said that what I should do is to be in the choir and sing. I've done my part and I've done the singing. I about evangelism. Uh -uh, I'm a choir member. We should have exceeded expectations. They told us to have women fellowship and we gathered them together. Well, not many people came, but I was faithful. I got there on that first Friday of the month, and the few people that were there, they said we should talk about how to have uh, milk from nuts. And uh, so I showed them, I taught them, and they said we should make sure we release the people in time. And once it was 8 o'clock, I released the people, and somebody said, uh, Sister, I need your attention. Actually, I've been coming, but I've not been saved, and I want to be saved. I want to have the victory. You know, look at the time. It's already 8 o'clock. They told us to close at 8 o'clock, and we're closing now. Maybe I'll see you next time. You should have exceeded expectation. It's not just that they have given us what to do and the time to spend, and because of that, I can do no more. Point number three, exceeding expectations in the labor of love. You will exceed expectations in Jesus' name. You will not be timing the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Lord Jesus, we have only one hour, and I'll spend the one hour. I'm through now. I cannot continue. You will continue. You will serve the Lord. You'll walk for the Lord. They told us to only lead, you know, these people and other people have come. From which district are you? From what street are you? And from this other street. Oh, my area does not cover that area. If you're dying, if you're sick, if you're a sinner, 
if you are perishing and you are going to hell and you are gasping for breath and you are about to die, I cannot talk to you. I cannot reach out to you. I cannot preach to you because you are not in my area. You are not in my district. You have a district pastor. He will take care of you. We must exceed expectations. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 3. For to their power, and I bear record, yea, beyond their power. They were willing of themselves. He said, I can testify of these people to their power, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us, pleading with us, with much entreaty, that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministry to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped. We hoped they reached this limit, and then they'll say bye-bye, we cannot continue, but did not as we hoped. But first, they gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. They gave themselves unto the Lord. They didn't stop there. Some people say, I know my consecration and God knows my consecration. I know my faithfulness. God knows my faithfulness. I know my labor and God knows my labor. I'm, I'm serving God. I'm not serving man. I'm serving God. I'm not going to, you know, just run because, uh, you know, of one man or one pastor there. Look at this. And this they did. Not as we hoped, but first they gave their own selves unto the Lord. And beyond giving themselves to the Lord, unto us by the will of God. They said all our talents, they are available. All our skill, they are available. All our time available, all our talent available, we have consecrated to God, but we need to make you know that we are available. I pray you'll be like that in Jesus' name. We're coming to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 12. Philippians chapter 2, reading from verse 12. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, as ye have always obeyed, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You have always obeyed, but then there is that extra, going the extra mile. There's that extra, doing the extra thing. In my presence, here is what you have done. In my presence, here is your faithfulness. In my presence, here is your obedience. But now, even in my absence, that you do much more. And he did that without grumbling. Look at verse 14. Do all things without murmuring and disputings. Not that, okay, we're there. But we are shifting and wriggling on our seats and saying, well, because we are workers, and you see, we have to be there, but our minds are not there, our body is there. We are thinking of this and thinking of this and thinking of that. And then we are grumbling and murmuring and disputing. It says, do all things without murmurings and without disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, a crooked, a corrupt, a perverse, a wicked, a cruel nation. All the problems were there in that nation, but among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life in preaching, Holding forth the word of life in evangelism. Holding forth the word of life in bringing people out of darkness into the light. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Colossians chapter 1. Reading from verse 28. Colossians chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 28. 
It says in verse 28, whom we preach, one in every man, whom we preach, one in every man. Paul the Apostle did not do some partial preaching, selected preaching. Those people are easy to deal with. I'll talk to them. Those people are kind of difficult. They made up their minds. They don't want to go to heaven. And so, I'm free from them. No, you are not free. Those other people are argumentative. I cannot talk to them. They're full of arguments. And so, I cannot reach out to them. No, you can. You can. Because it says, who will preach? Warning every man. The careless. Warning every man. The argumentative. Warning every man. The difficult ones. Warning everyone. The rejectors. Warning every man. And teaching every man in all wisdom. If, they, if Paul the Apostle didn't have the wisdom to, uh, to deal with this group, he'll go and pray, God, I need to get the gospel across to those difficult people and to those rejectors, and to those gainsayers. And it looks like I don't have the wisdom now. And I'm praying for the wisdom. You will pray and have the wisdom to reach out to all the people that you need to reach out to teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present how many people? Every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his walking you know, which walketh in me my chili. That walk will continue and we will continue the labor of love in Jesus name. In First Thessalonians chapter 1. First Thessalonians chapter 1. We're reading from verse 3. First Thessalonians chapter 1. Reading from verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. The Thessalonians have been brought to know the Lord and they themselves, they followed the example of Paul the Apostle. He labored in the work of faith, so they did. He labored in the labor of love, and so they did. And he labored in the patience of hope, and they did. And so Paul the apostle rejoicing because of them, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father. Look at verse 5, for our gospel came not unto you, in watch only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as she know what manner of men we were among you for your sakes, and ye became, and ye became, and ye became followers of us. You see, that's what we are to do. You are to make those converts, and those disciples, and all the members followers of the leadership. The leadership is up and doing. They too should be up and doing. The leadership is evangelizing. And they should be evangelizing. You are evangelizing. And they will be evangelizing. And you are walking in love. You are walking by faith. You are walking in hope. And you are doing everything according to the teaching of the word of God. And they do the same. And you became followers of us and of the Lord. Having received the word in much affliction. There are problems too. That didn't make them to give up. They had persecution too. That didn't make them to give up. They had much affliction. That didn't make them to give up. That didn't make them like, you know, always uh, saying, Apostle, pray for us. There's a problem. Always asking for prayer. Always asking for help. Always asking for upliftment. Always asking for counseling. All they have heard in all these years is not enough to counsel them. They must still lean upon the leader. But these people, they receive the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. They will say joyful so that ye were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. 
For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God's word is spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. These uh, converts were also preachers. They were soul winners. They were witnesses. And they went out in all their communities, for they themselves show forth what manner of entering in we urge unto you. And now how ye turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven. They were hopeful of the rapture and they, pre they were prepared for the coming of the Lord. Anytime he will come, they were ready to wait for, the, for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. I pray we'll be like that. You will be like that. We'll do more than we have ever done. Every day we'll have addition to our skill, addition to our fervency, addition to our seriousness, addition to our sacrifice in Jesus' name more and more in your life more and more in your ministry more and more look at first thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1 first thessalonians chapter 1 chapter 4 i'm reading from verse 1 furthermore then we beseech you brethren these were the people they were already evangelizing already touching their communities already preaching the gospel Already Paul the Apostle said in Macedonia and Achaia and other places, your word, your testimony, your preaching has gone forth. And we don't even need to say anything when we got there. You have already taught them the gospel. But now it says, furthermore, more than you have done, furthermore, more than your evangelism, furthermore, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk, how ye ought to labor, how ye ought to evangelize, and how ye ought to please God in your evangelism, and please God in your service, and please God in your zeal, how ye ought to please God in your zealous work for the Lord, so ye would abound more and more. So ye would abound more and more. He was saying, let your conviction grow. He was saying, let your compassion grow. He was saying, let your contribution to the expansion of the gospel, extension of evangelism, let your contribution grow. Let your consistency grow. Let your courage grow. Let your cooperation together as we are walking together and taking the gospel everywhere. Let that cooperation grow and let your consecration, your commitment to the commission, the great commission, let each grow or will grow. Was saying, make progress. This year, you'll make progress. With conviction, you'll make progress. With compassion, you'll make progress. Amen. With your clear conscience, you'll make progress. And with costly contribution, you'll make progress. In consistency, you'll make progress. With constant courage, never allowing anything to beat your back, you'll make progress. In commitment, you'll make progress. In consecration, you'll make progress. Without compromise. Without carnality. Without covetousness. Without corruption. Without contention. Without competition with anyone. Without contradiction. Furthermore, then, brothers and sisters, furthermore, then, ministers and leaders, furthermore, then, overseers and pastors, we, we exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk, how ye ought to please God in this new year, so ye would abound more and more. I would abound more and more. 
you will abound more and more in Jesus' name. Let, let's rise up now and take this message of the Lord in prayer on leadership, excellent leadership in an expanding ministry. What are you going to do this year? How much are you going to work for the Lord this year? How are you going to expand this year? How are you going to lead this year? Remember, it's expensive if you exalt the lost to leadership. Make sure you are not lost. The lost, leading the lost, will fall into the ditch. The ignorant, leading the ignorant, will fall into the ditch. The carnal, leading the carnal, will fall into the ditch. The forgetful, leading the forgetful, will fall into the ditch. Lukewarm, cold, apathetic, always tired, sluggish, no excitement, no zeal. The lukewarm, leading the lukewarm, will fall into the ditch. The backslider, leading the backslider, will fall into the ditch. The wanderer, not delving into the word of God, all that he has said, all that she has said, and is still wandering on the internet, wandering on the YouTube, wandering here and there, and is not digesting anything. The wanderer leading the wanderer will fall into the ditch. The greedy, those who are hungry for power, leading other people who are hungry for power, they fall into the ditch. The hypocrite, leading the hypocrite, will fall into the ditch. Talk to the Lord and say, Lord, help me in this new year that I will stand on the word of God and evangelism will expand. I will take up, I will follow through on the landmark we've got from the Lord. And you exceed expectations. Exceed expectations. Whatever you think is expected of you, go beyond that and let the watchword in your ministry, in your service, in your sacrifice, be more and more, more and more, more and more. Brethren, let's just 